ートビデオ You know, we have been talking about the lighter side of 80s anime quite a lot on the show so far. In fact, if you've been watching the show up to this point and had no prior knowledge of retro anime, you could be forgiven for thinking that anime of this era is all just a bunch of fun and games. An era defined by bright, colorful art styles and palettes. An era defined by themes of self-sacrifice and hope in the face of adversity. An era defined by fun, action-packed romps that still carry a light-hearted tone in spite of its violent content. So if you ask me, it's high time we turn over to the dark side. While light colorful styles were prevalent in the 80s, with some exceptions, it mostly tended to be restricted to television. The then booming OVA market, on the other hand, no longer constrained by content regulation, preferred a darker, more mature atmosphere, one full of violence, nudity, and cynical views on the nature of humanity, all wrapped up in a grim and gritty package. To some retro anime fans, this was the true 80s. And at the center of it all was a man named Yoshiaki Kawajiri. The patron saint of gritty, dark retro anime, Yoshiaki Kawajiri is a director you probably have come across once in your anime viewing life, even if you didn't know his name. His movies and OVAs were what defined Studio Madhouse for much of the 80s and 90s. If you were an anime fan then, there was a good chance one of his titles graced your VCR. Titles like Ninja Scroll, Wicked City, Demon City Shinjuku, and of course, the infamous cult classic, Cyber City Oedo 808. Hey Benton, don't crap your pants if you see a vampire out there. Get lost. You wouldn't recognize a goddamn vampire if one jumped up and bit you on the end of your fucking dick. But while I could talk about either of those well-known anime that I just listed, I've decided to talk about one of Kawajiri's lesser-known works. <sighs> they just don't get it. This damn city's been flattened by earthquakes twice, but they just keep rebuilding. Bigger and flashier than before. It's a great big gaudy slice of chaos dancing on the brink of oblivion. And I call it home. My name is Goku. Goku Midnight Eye is a two-part OVA conceived from a collaboration between Kawajiri and Buichi Terasawa, author of the legendary Space Adventure Cobra manga. An adaptation of one of Terasawa's short-lived manga series, the plot centers around Private Eye and hater of dress shirts, Goku Ferengi, who, after nearly being murdered while pursuing a case, receives a state-of-the-art cybernetic eye from a mysterious, unseen benefactor that not only allows him to see, but analyze and access every computer known to man, up to and including the nuclear launch codes to every country. He is also given a technologically advanced extending bow staff as well. So basically, it's Blade Runner meets Journey to the West. As stated above, the plot consists of two episodes. Part 1 focuses on how Goku gets his titular eye while pursuing an arms dealer and his colorful cast of henchmen, while Part 2 is a standalone case in which Goku is commissioned by a young woman to save her brother who is a rampaging super soldier who happens to be killing everything in his path. Think Brian Fury except louder, angrier, and with superpowers. <laughs> Now one area where this anime thrives in is its setting. Kawajiri is a master of dark atmosphere, particularly with his urban environments. With the cyber noir setting he and his team are given, they manage to illustrate a perfect picture of a chrome and neon cesspit of a city with its heavy use of shadows against bright, oppressive lighting. This is best shown in scenes where one color will just dominate a scene to best heighten the mood, whether that mood be blue somberness, or bright red danger. Huh? <sighs> the atmospheric setting also ends up being a great backdrop for the action. Animation-wise, Goku Midnight Eye is economical when it comes to its non-action scenes. This shot in particular gets used more than once in both episodes. In those scenes, the money goes towards making the scene look as detailed as possible while fitting the cyber noir setting. But when it comes to the action, the money is all there on the screen. It looks so smooth and rarely loses its detail. Special mention goes to how they manage to keep a chrome machine on Goku's staff in every shot. 
It must have been a pain in the ass to not give in to temptation and just have it be a gray stick. Character designs are standard for a Kawajiri joint of the 80s, even though he didn't design them. Men are tan, muscular, and lantern jawed. Women are ivory skinned with raven black hair and ruby red lips. The most interesting designs in this piece come from the villainous henchmen of part 1. If you watched a clip of this anime and saw that it had a naked woman who hypnotizes people with her cybernetic peacock feathers, or a gyanoid motorcycle stripper that shoots lasers out of her mouth, it would probably get your attention. <sighs> Shame the same can't be said for part 2 where most of the interesting designs come from the generic street punks, while our main antagonist is just Zack Hugh from The Running Man. Soundtrack is... there. It sets an appropriate mood for each scene, but, but nothing particularly memorable or worth commenting on. There are some weird choices for foley work though. You see, 90% of the time it'll be fine, gunshots sound like gunshots, crunching metal sounds like crunching metal, but for the other 10% they do something like this. <laughs> Speaking of weird audio, let's talk about the dub. It's bad, but bad in a specific way. You've noticed in the clips I've shown so far that Goku sounds very familiar. Well, this is a surprise. I knew you were happy to see me, but I had no idea you were this happy. Just a humble bounty hunter, ma'am. Yep, that's Steve Bloom, all right. And it's not just him. Kirk Thornton and Wendy Lee are also in this, and they all sound wooden as hell. It's no use, we can't get away. Those horrible things are relentless. There's no hiding from them. They can see in the dark and they never give up, not until they've run their prey into the ground. But wait, you ask. These voice actors went on to have long, fruitful careers. Why do they sound like every other dub that was being produced at the time? And the answer to that is direction. Like stage acting itself, voice acting requires direction. And bad direction can result in a bad performance by an otherwise good voice actor. Here you can tell the ADR director is not helping the actors sell their parts, and is just making them read the script resulting in what sounds like a series of flat reads. The result is long stretches of boring punctuated by tiny bits of unintentional hilarity. Takama! Oh no! But a bad dub is the least of Goku Midnight Eye's problems. You see, the reason why I wanted to talk about this anime is that it is easily Kawajiri's weakest work. So why is that? Well, to start things off, the story feels very gimmicky. The whole story is based around Goku's titular eye. It is the main source of what makes Goku unique as a hero, be given this eye that gives him an untold amount of power in a future where everything is connected via computers. He could even utilize the launch codes of every nuclear missile and destroy the world if he wish. A point the anime bestows an enormous amount of gravitas to. If I wanted to, I could hack into the launch codes of every nuclear power, send the missiles up, and destroy the planet. So essentially in this far-flung cyberpunk internet of things future of 2014, Goku is given the powers of a god, and therein lies the problem. Goku is too powerful. There is literally nothing stopping him from hacking into a military satellite laser and blasting all his problems from orbit from a safe distance. There is no logical reason why he should go in and face his opponents one on one where he increases his chances of being killed. Barring the eye, Goku is still very much a human being, with all the physical weaknesses that entails. I get that having our hero theoretically solve all his problems from one safe location does not an interesting story make, but having the crux of this anime be this one cheat code of an eye that's already filled with plot holes really highlights the weaknesses of the script. And even then, the eye still could have been a way to explore a lot of interesting topics. It could have been used as a means to comment on the reliance of computers, on how that reliance is both a blessing and a curse how dangerous it could be to connect everything to one system. But no, this is an action anime for manly men, nothing more, nothing less. The action cannot have mere trifles getting in its way, such as themes or character. Yes, character is also non-existent in Goku Midnight Eye. Goku has zero character aside from being a cool badass who grimly mutters noir-style monologues to himself. So my left eye is some kind of computer terminal, huh? Okay, I'll play along. Could be interesting. Who did this to me? Why? The hell does he want me to do with it? Oh well. For now, I guess I'll just play it by ear. We could infer that he has general cunningness due to the many ways he can figure out how to use his eye, but that's about it. 
he appears to have little strength and faults to his character which leaves him unable to have any character growth. The only real piece of character development we do see from him is all tacked on at the end of the second part and it is such a stock noir speech he might as well be saying forget it Jake, it's Chinatown. So much for this left eye of mine. It may be able to hack into every database on earth, still as far as women go. I'm just as blind as the next guy. I never see trouble come until it's breathing down my neck. Well, I'm finished with him. Next pretty face I see, I'll just keep on walking. Yeah, <laughs> right. That'll be the day. And every other male character is either a blank slate bit part used as a means to move Goku to the next plot point, or villains that are either cartoonishly evil. What are you waiting for? Get that man out of here and do it quickly. That rug he's bleeding on is worth a fortune. Or in the case of Ryu from Part 2, a generic malevolent force that is not compelling in the least. I think the anime wants us to sympathize with him considering he was made into a roided out killing machine against his will, but... Just the way you like it, big boy. Huh? I really don't see that happening. But this scene brings us to a big... Big issue with Goku Midnight Eye, how it treats its female characters. Kawajiri in general has a problem with how he portrays women in his works. His female characters can usually be boiled down to two archetypes, the female sidekick slash love interest who will either get kidnapped or killed by the main antagonist to give our hero some pathos, and the seductive femme fatale with weird powers that usually involves that usually involve her to get naked as much as possible and is usually killed by one of our protagonists. In Goku Midnight Eye, we see these two archetypes at their most extreme. There are two femme fatales here, and they are characters in the loosest of definitions. Silent, sexy, and naked at all times, they are weaponized eye candy. Guns with a pair of breasts attached to them. Only Miss Peacock here has one line, and she says it right after she's killed off. But how? What happened? It always worked before, always. Not that the female protagonists are treated any better. In the first part, we have Yoko Yazaki, who is introduced as a bite a police detective who is willing to help Goku with the case to avenge her dead partners. Unfortunately, the only thing she does do is get Goku into the bad guy's hideout. After that, she is immediately hypnotized into trying to seduce and kill Goku. She gets naked, she gets jabbed in the gut, and as soon as she comes to her senses, is immediately killed off and shoved into the fridge to give Goku a purpose to avenge her, all while she is still naked. Classy. Then there's Ryoko Kodoma from part two. The woman who tasked Goku to save her rampaging brother, and boy does she get it worse than Yoko because all she is is the sobbing broad in every hack noir story. She not only exists to get weepy, get sexed up by the protagonist, get sexually assaulted by the villains, and subsequently get killed in the end so said protagonist can get some more unearned pathos, but also be reduced to nothing more than a living plot twist in the last 10 minutes of the episode. She's never been the same since her brother died 15 years ago. <laughs> Am I going too fast for you? She is not your sister. That was nothing but an artificial memory implanted in your brain while you incubated in your capsule. You might call it a dream. Of course, Ryu. It took more than one of my cells to create you. We also needed a female egg in which your embryo could develop. And whose egg was it? That's right. The woman you thought was your sister was really your mother. And that is not even going into the unnamed female characters who only exist as either victimized sex objects or just plain old fashioned sex objects. Probably the only female character that doesn't get victimized in this anime is Goku's client in the beginning of part one, and I don't think the anime does her any favors either. By the way, if you want to keep this key I wouldn't mind. I'll pass, thanks. Call me nuts, but I'd rather not wake up one day with a bullet hole through some vital part of my anatomy. And what really bothers me about all this is that in Kawajiri's other works, the woman still felt like actual characters. Badly treated characters, but characters nonetheless. In Goku Midnight Eye, however, the women aren't characters. They are smoking hot accessories meant to show how Goku is this virile men among men who has all these hot chicks falling over themselves to get at him and he still cares about them because he gets mopey when they die. Oh my god, he's so cool and strong yet sweet and sensitive and blah de blah de blah. And I don't think it's entirely Kawajiri's fault. Hear me out. I think this direction is more of Buiji Terasawa's influence. 
He did, after all, write the original manga, and his most famous work involves a roguishly handsome space pirate flying around space solving problems while banging every chick he can conceivably get. So I think it would make sense to think that the reason why women are treated more as accessories to the male protagonist than real actual characters with any depth to them would be due to Terasawa. Why do I think this? Because through Buichi Terasawa's own words, that is entirely the case. <laughs> What a classy guy. So, yeah. With all these terrible gender politics, Goku Midnight Eye is a very hard anime to recommend. But even if you took those unsavory elements out and focused on the great action and setting, you're still left with a lackluster story and character. What Goku Midnight Eye is trying to sell you on is spectacle. Pure cyberpunk spectacle. It doesn't want you to indulge in themes or characters or anything meaningful. It just wants you to show you this cool guy with a cool power who can hack into any computer and fight off cyborgs and super soldiers. At best, Goku Midnight Eye is a guilty pleasure anime, entertaining at some parts, but overall hampered by its gimmicks and overall sleaziness that will sicken quite a few people out there. If you need a gritty anime fix, there are certainly better Kawajiri works out there, but if you really need to see a little guy riding a gynoid motorcycle stripper with 80s hair that shoots lasers out of her mouth, then be my guest. <sighs> No, no, no.